Peyton Manning and the Broncos continue to light up the fantasy scoreboard, but should fantasy owners be concerned about Wes Welker and Ronnie Hillman? Also, Percy Harvin will be making his debut in the Jets lineup on Sunday, but should he be in your fantasy lineup? I'll answer your questions from YouTube and Twitter and give you my busts and sleepers for week eight. It's all on today's episode of the Fantasy Football Swagger Podcast. What is up, everybody? Welcome to the Fantasy Football Swagger Podcast. I am your host, Nick, also known as Clickwood, and I am riding solo again on today's episode. Going to try and do my best here. I normally like to have somebody to bounce ideas off of and converse with, but I'm not above speaking to myself, so we'll try and do that today, guys. Week 8 is already underway, and things continue to just get better and better for Peyton Manning and the Denver Broncos Three touchdowns again this week, all three of them to Emmanuel Sanders. Now, what's funny is that Sanders didn't have a single touchdown prior to week seven, and now he has four over his past two games, so pretty impressive. I knew it was going to happen eventually. I think people were kind of assuming that for whatever reason, Emmanuel Sanders just wasn't going to score touchdowns this year, kind of like, you know, Keyshawn Johnson did years ago where I think he caught like a hundred and something passes and then only had one or I don't even know if he scored a touchdown that year. It was, it was a low number though, given the number of receptions that he had. But from a fantasy standpoint, obviously we look for touchdowns. We think that that's an extremely important thing, but even though he didn't have many touchdowns or any touchdowns really prior to uh, week seven, like I said, the guy was still putting up huge numbers. I mean, he was catching big time passes all the way down the field, making big time plays, uh, tons of catches as well. I mean, the, he's definitely on pace to be one of the top receivers this year, both in terms of yardage and catches. And now that he's getting into the end zone, I mean, there's no reason that Emmanuel Sanders shouldn't be a top 10 fantasy wide receiver. I thought that he would be a sleeper going into the year, and it has turned out to absolutely be correct, especially with Wes Welker being out early in the year. He was able to get some of that rep uh, repetition in there with Peyton Manning, and that really made things very, very good for him because he was able to get down the field, make big plays, but also kind of contribute as your Wes Welker-like possession receiver short. So that's a really great combination for a fantasy wide receiver, and that's why I'm I'm absolutely in love with this dude as a fantasy specimen. I mean, the guy is going to put up huge numbers all year unless he gets hurt. So if somebody out there in your, in your league for whatever reason doesn't believe in this guy, uh, they think that he is at his peak or whatever. I mean, he probably is. He's probably not going to have another three touchdown game this year. But I'm, what I'm saying is if somebody is trying to sell on him and trying to sell quote unquote high on him, I would be a buyer on Emmanuel Sanders right now. Um, obviously, I'm not going to give up like a very, very top wide receiver. Like I'm not trading Jordy Nelson for him, Antonio Brown. I'm probably not trading one of the top running backs. But if you can put together a package deal to potentially get somebody like Emmanuel Sanders, you know, if, if your suitor needs a running back and you have to give up a mid-tier running back and a solid wide receiver, you know, a Kelvin Benjamin and, uh, you know, like an Alfred Morris or something like that to get Emmanuel Sanders, I would 100% do that deal. This guy is going to be a rock solid starter. I think he's a wide receiver one going forward for fantasy. He already has been a wide receiver one for the most part, but um, at least at the very least, he is going to be a solid wide receiver too. So we very much like that for fantasy purposes. But the thing is, Wes Welker has not been producing. Wes Welker, since he's come back, really hasn't done a whole lot. I mean, he's definitely the guy that I'm concerned most about in this lineup. Only six total catches for 63 yards over his past three games combined. He didn't score a touchdown in Week 7. Or he did, excuse me, score a touchdown in Week 7. But I'm still concerned. The biggest worry that I have about this guy is that he's just not even getting targeted. I mean, we expected him to at least be the third option in this this offense behind Demarius Thomas and Julius Thomas, but not fourth. I didn't think that he would actually be behind Emmanuel Sanders in targets, and, um, and honestly... He's not even getting targeted hardly that much more than the other receivers in, on this team. You know, like your Jacob Tammies when he's out there even. I mean, Welker is just not getting the targets that he needs to be a consistent fantasy wide receiver. Welker is definitely the kind of guy who needs to have a lot of reps in order to get 
fantasy production. He's not going to beat defenses deep very often. Uh, it happens maybe once, maybe twice a year that he gets a 30, 40 yard reception where he actually beats them deep and doesn't just, you know, catch a six yard pass and break it. So in order for him to get those fantasy points that we need for our, our teams, he needs to be out there. He needs to be getting targeted 10 times a game. And that's not happening. It's not happening anywhere near that. I mean, there was a, a game, what, two, three weeks ago now where he only had three targets and the guy's healthy. You know, I mean, we were kind of worried that when he came back that he would have lost a little bit of the, you know, the chemistry that he had with Peyton Manning, but that hasn't really been the case. I don't think, I think it's more just there's so many other guys in the offense, and the other guys are producing better than Wes Welker, to be completely honest. I still think Welker could potentially turn things around, and he's probably going to have a good game here and there, but predicting when those games are going to be is going to be extremely tough to do unless he starts getting targeted more often. And in order for that to happen, guys like Julius Thomas and Demarius Thomas are probably going to have to start to get targeted less. Now, one thing that we need to look at here a little bit, Julius Thomas through the first six weeks of the season, was by far and away the number one fantasy tight end. The guy is still on pace at this point after not having a touchdown in his past two games to shatter the single season touchdown record, not just for a wide or tight end, but for any position, wide receiver included. So I think that there's a really good shot that Julius Thomas ends as the wide or as the tight end one still, um, with especially with Jimmy Graham still being banged up. I I don't have any real concerns about him. But the thing is, is that defenses are focusing on him right now, which is allowing guys like Emmanuel Sanders to catch passes. Guys like Emmanuel Sanders need the defenses to be focused on other players, and that's what they're doing. Julius Thomas, Demarius Thomas are getting focused on very, very heavily, and Emmanuel Sanders is beating the crap out of defenses because of that. I don't really see that changing a whole lot. I do think Julius Thomas is going to have better games, obviously. He only has four catches in his past two games, no touchdowns, under 30 yards in both games, so he's been very, very disappointing. Just in the past two games, though, you can't really complain when you consider the fact that this guy has been an absolute monster. I think that he is pretty much an ideal buy low right now because of the back-to-back -back bad games. There might be an owner out there who's thinking that, you know, they're pressing the red button, they're they're canceling on Julius Thomas, they want to get rid of him because they think that he's not going to be that big of a part of the offense going forward. Guys, I'm telling you, this guy is going to put up huge numbers this year, just like Emmanuel Sanders is, just like Demarius Thomas is. This offense is very clearly the, the number one offense in the league. I said that going into the year, nothing has changed. They are going to score the most points. They're going to have the most yards and they're going to be the most fantasy relevant team. That's the thing that we love about these guys is that they don't score a whole lot of touchdowns with random players. They score mostly with their studs. Now, now that I say that, however, I do think that I need to point out Jawan Thompson scored both of the running back touchdowns this past week. Now, I don't really think that there's a whole lot we can pull from that. Uh, I don't think that they dislike Ronnie Hillman at the goal line or anything like that, but uh, it is definitely worth considering that Jawan Thompson did touch the ball twice at about the one yard line on a fullback dive, basically, because uh, Ronnie Hillman, I think, was out on the field on both of those touchdowns, if I remember correctly. But from a fantasy standpoint, Jawan Thompson isn't going to be anything of significant value uh, unless... Uh, Ronnie Hillman does go down, and then even if Ronnie Hillman goes down, Monty Ball is probably going to be back, so it would need to be both of those guys being injured for him to really have much relevance in the fantasy game, but I still think Ronnie Hillman is easily the guy that you want to own here. He has 200 or two 100-yard rushing games over his past three games, 10 catches in his three starts, and I mean, he's just playing out of his mind. This is a guy that's been a very disappointing player since the Broncos drafted him, and he finally got his opportunity to really start once Monty Ball went down. And from that point on, the guy has been a top 10 fantasy running back over the past three weeks. I mean, he's putting up big time numbers, running back one numbers for sure. So I think that Hillman... He has a lot of value at the moment, especially with Monty Ball being out. The real question is that when Monty Ball comes back, are we going to see a downtick in touches for Ronnie Hillman? And I think that the answer to that question is going to be yes. Now, is it going to be substantial enough that we start to reduce our value significantly on Ronnie Hillman? I'm not sure. I still think that he's going to get probably 70 60 to 70 percent of the snaps at the running back position which in the Denver offense is really what we're looking for 
The question, though, becomes, is he going to lose goal line carries to Monty Ball and even, you know, Jawan Thompson or guys like that, just random players who can potentially go in there and score? That's the real concern here. I like Hillman's opportunity to get big yardage for the rest of the year. Um, You know, coming into the season, you guys know I was pretty high on Monty Ball. That hasn't turned out to be the best decision making on my part. But the reason that I was high on Monty Ball was not because I love Monty Ball as a player. The reason was because I looked at this Denver offense and I said, they're going to score more points than anybody. And so far they have. They're putting up monster numbers every single game. Peyton Manning's out of control. And when they get down to the one, two yard line, they have no problem running the ball. Peyton Manning's known for scoring touchdowns, obviously, but they'll run the ball at the two yard line, the one yard line. They'll score touchdowns at the goal line. And if you don't have the running back in the offense that's scoring those touchdowns, that can be a problem. Now, it's not to say that he won't still have decent fantasy production, but if he has 100 yards total, let's say, and, you know, two, three catches like he has been, well, that's a solid day. It's an 11 to 12 point game, depending on, of course, your scoring system, 10 point potentially if you don't have any PPR at all. But the lack of touchdown is really painful because if he was just to score that one touchdown from one yard out, he suddenly moves his day from being a 10 to 12 point game to a 16 to 18 point game. And that makes him go from a, just a solid RB2, like a, a decent to high end RB2 to being a rock solid RB1, just that one play. So I think that that is a little bit of a concern. I would consider selling high right now on Ronnie Hillman, just given the fact that their their offense could change once Monty Ball comes back. And I know Monty Ball was horrible. He's not good. Ronnie Hillman has easily secured himself, in my opinion, the job there as far as being the feature back. But that doesn't necessarily mean that he is going to get all of the carries going forward. Most NFL teams do not bench players because of injury. So that's something to consider. Monty Ball was not benched because he wasn't playing well. He wasn't playing well. Don't get me wrong. He really wasn't. And I'm sure the coaching staff understands that. I'm sure that they can see it on film. But the fact is that you just don't do that in the NFL. It's like a, it's just an unwritten rule. You do not bench players because of injury. So, you know, it's, it's not very common that that happens. Um, so I think that he is still going to get a decent enough care amount of carries that Ronnie Hillman is going to be affected by it. I'm not super high on Monty Ball just because we don't know at this point, but you know, you have to go with the assumption that he's still going to get some touches. So that is something to be a little bit concerned about. Now, guys, I did also want to talk a little bit about the new addition to the New York Jets offense. We did a specific fantasy football swagger podcast about that Uh, this past week. I talked about Percy Harvin being moved over to the New York Jets from the Seattle Seahawks. And the question now becomes, this being his first game this weekend, the Jets are probably going to try and put him into their offense, I think a pretty decent amount, but is he good enough this week to be in your fantasy lineup? And of course, you know, it really comes down to what you have for other options. I don't think Percy Harvin right now is good enough to be in the top 24 at wide receiver, which I know might be surprising to people because I was telling you that I think that this guy, his value does rise when he goes to the Jets, just because I think he's going to touch the ball more there. But the real question, guys, is how how are they going to use him in the offense? We don't know at this point exactly what Rex Ryan and the rest of the coaching staff there is going to do with their new weapon. You know, obviously Rex Ryan's not out there calling the plays, but he might be in the decision-making prior to the game. And these guys are saying, look, we just got this guy. We have to make it look like, you know, he's going to be a featured part of this offense. Otherwise, what's the point? People are going to start getting pissed off that we traded uh, a mid-round pick just to get a guy who, you know, doesn't really do anything in our offense. So I do think that he's going to touch the ball probably five to seven times this week. So probably I'm guessing like three to four catches, three to four runs, some somewhere in that range so that we can get a decent sample size of what Harvin is going to do for the Jets. And hopefully that happens. So, you know, then we can get kind of a better idea going forward on whether or not we should have him in our lineup. But for this week and this week alone, I'm going to sit him down just because I don't exactly know what's going to happen. He's in a new offense. Maybe he hasn't learned the full playbook yet. I do think that they're going to have a few plays that are specifically set up for him, whether they be carries out of the backfield that aren't really difficult to learn or, you know, a simple screen pass or something like that, that, you know, he could potentially break because he's that type of an explosive player. But Buffalo's defense, who is uh, who is uh, the defense that they're going to be up against, has been very, very good this year. They create a lot of 
of pass rush. Um, I don't think Geno Smith is going to have a lot of time behind the line of scrimmage to stand there and try and hit Percy Harvin deep. So the big play explosive ability this week, I'm not super excited about for Percy Harvin. Obviously, if he, you're in a desperate situation, you're going to have to take the chance on him. But I think if there's other guys that, you know, could potentially have okay games for you, you know, an Odell Beckham, that type of a guy, I would probably play them over a Percy Harvin this week. So I hopefully that'll help you guys out a little bit. And I did also want to answer some of your Twitter and YouTube questions that you guys left. Uh, if you do have any questions for me, make sure that you drop them in the YouTube comment section below. Or of course, you can tweet them to me at ClickWithTV at any time. I, if I favorite your question and there's a good chance that it's going to be answered in the podcast. So uh, make sure that you listen uh, to the podcast so that you can get the answer. But the first question is going to come from my buddy Ben Anderson NFL on Twitter. And he has a question regarding a league that actually gives points to return yardage. So they give for every 25 yards that you get, I'm assuming either punt or a kick returning. Punt returning is pretty difficult to get big yardage. But every 25 yards, you actually do get a point. So I think that that's kind of interesting. Um, it adds a nice dynamic to your league. Not a lot of leagues do y return yardage because it's so hard to predict and, and random guys then start to become really valuable. You know, I, I remember for a while in a kick return yardage league that I was in, Leon Washington started to be a monster player, you know, and then you've had guys uh, obviously like the Devin Hesters in the past and, and Josh Cribbs and guys like that who average big return yardage, they start to become significant fantasy values. So uh, it it's something you can consider doing for your league next year. But to answer this guy's question he needs me to pick three in in this league that also includes return yardage so we've got Antonio Brown Roddy White Doug Baldwin Andre Holmes and Jarvis Landry so right off the bat Antonio Brown is in your lineup I don't care really what scoring system it is um, it really doesn't matter the guy is arguably the wide receiver one in the entire NFL going forward so don't ask me any questions about Antonio Brown unless he's hurt or something. He should be in your lineup, period. I don't care, like I said, what the uh, what the situation is. The second guy that I'm going to recommend is actually Doug Baldwin. And Doug Baldwin had a monster game this past week. Uh, I like his chances this week to have another good game. He is the wide receiver one now in Seattle, so we definitely like to see that. And normally, I would actually probably say Jarvis Landry would be my third guy over a guy like Roddy White because you do get those kick return points. Now, what's interesting about these kick return yardage leagues that a lot of people don't think of when they're first starting is that you actually almost want to have, if you're if you're specifically going after a guy who's a kick returner, you almost want to have a guy who's on a really, really bad defense or, you know, something like that. So, or, or they're going up against a really, really good offense. So, like, for example, if you were, if you got, like, the Jacksonville Jaguars kick returner, they're more likely to get a lot of kick return yardage because there's more opportunities. A team scores and then they have to kick the ball off. Well, even if you only get 20 return yards, that's a pretty good day because you only need two, three, four of those, and then suddenly we're talking three, four points on the board. And as long as you're somebody that can also contribute in the passing game, you know, that's a nice little bonus to have. So I definitely would normally recommend Jarvis Landry because he's going to be a guy that's going to be their primary kick returner in Miami. But the question now when you look at it is how many points can Jacksonville actually put onto the board? Jacksonville is the team that they're up against. Their offense has been super up and down this year. Um, for the most part down because they're Jacksonville and they're terrible. But I look at it like this. If they score two to three times in this game, which is what I kind of expect to happen if Jacksonville does, that means that he, that means that uh, Jarvis Landry is only going to have probably three, possibly four chances at a kick return if, that's if, the kicker doesn't boot it out of the back of the end zone or he has to take a knee. So we have to, of course, consider all of those things. I don't think that Jarvis Landry is a substantial enough part of the offense there that I would really be even thinking about his receiving yardage. I mean, he could catch two, three passes, but it's not usually going to be significant enough that it's going to be fantasy value on its own. So I'm going to go ahead and sit him this week just based on the fact that Jacksonville's offense is so terrible. Roddy White is the guy that I'm going to go with here, and I know he's been really disappointing for the most part, but I still think that he's part of an offense that can put points onto the board. Um, it's not going to probably be anything where he's going to be a top 10 wide receiver this week, but 
I still think that Roddy White is enough of a part of a good offense that he should probably be in your lineup as your wide receiver three at minimum um, behind Doug Baldwin and Antonio Brown. So I hope that answers your question, Ben. Next question comes from Beast Gone Gamer on YouTube, and he wants to know, is it time to get rid of players like Vincent Jackson, Doug Martin, and Keenan Allen? Now, this is a really good question because we are at the halfway point in the season. Um, it's kind of the point where you look at what guys have done up until this point and you decide where are they going to go from here? I mean, are they likely to turn their season around if they're having a bad year or is it likely going to continue that they're not going to put up fantasy points? Well, I know Vincent Jackson has been frustrating. I know through the first four or five weeks of the season, he was one of the most disappointing fantasy players. Josh McCown wasn't getting him the ball. Mike Glennon, when he first took over, uh, he wasn't he wasn't consistent enough, I should say. Um, he was targeting Vincent Jackson a decent amount. And he did score a touchdown in weeks three and four. And then when you look at week five, he actually had a pretty solid game. I mean, I know it's not spectacular, the 144-yard game, though, is pretty good. Eight catches, 144 yards. If you're in a PPR league, that's, what, a 22.4-point game? I'll definitely take that. I mean, that's nothing to complain about at all. The touchdowns in Week 3 and 4 saved his day. And then this past week, if you're in a PPR league, it's a 10-point game. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, it's not a great game, like I said, but, I mean, it could certainly be worse. I am not going to panic on him yet. Mike Landon is definitely the better quarterback for him. We see him targeting him a ton. I do think that when Mike Evans is fully healthy again, because uh, right now he's not fully healthy, but once he does get fully healthy, I think that he is going to take away some of the attention from the defense, which should help Vincent Jackson just a little bit. So I'm not panicking too much on him. Maybe bench him if you're worried, but I'm not cutting him at this point. Keenan Allen. 15 catches over his past two games, scored on Thursday. I still think he's going to turn it around from there. I still think that Keenan Allen is going to end up being a solid wide receiver too going forward. Eddie Royal is not going to continue to be a fantasy factor, in my opinion, just like he wasn't last year. Started off super strong. End of the year was pretty much irrelevant. I think Keenan Allen is still the guy there. Maybe he doesn't put up the same numbers that he did in his rookie season, but in his rookie season, the guy was arguably a borderline wide receiver one. And through the final like 10 weeks of the season, he was a wide receiver one. So... I mean, for him to not being put up, putting up those type of numbers is okay. We don't need him to necessarily. What we're looking for is for him to put up at least wide receiver two numbers. And if he catches six to seven passes a game, which I think that he could for the remainder of the year, that is good enough that he is still going to be valuable in your standard scoring leagues. So, and even in your PPR leagues, I still think that Keenan Allen is going to be good enough to own. I would not be cutting him. If you want to trade him after he had a pretty good game here this past week, go ahead and do that. But I would definitely not be cutting him. Doug Martin, on the other hand, hasn't rushed for more than 45 yards in any game this year. Doesn't have more than three catches in any game. Tampa Bay's offense isn't very good. Uh, they're not the worst, but they're certainly not very good. And they're not somebody that is going to be putting up enough points that you're going to have a substantial opportunity to score multiple touchdowns in many games. So I don't like Doug Martin really going forward. Not to mention the fact that Bobby Rainey is getting about 40% of the carries right now. So he's splitting carries in an offense that isn't very good. He's not producing with the carries that he's getting, and he's not catching very many passes. I don't know what there's to like about Doug Martin at this point. Now, obviously, it depends on what's available on your waiver wire, but I would definitely be dropping Doug Martin for whatever running back breaks out this week. There's usually one. You know, somebody gets hurt, and then there's an opportunity for somebody else to step up, or, um, you know, a rookie gets their first opportunity and looks pretty good in an offense that maybe the starter isn't spectacular so far in. You know, opportunities like that arise pretty much every week, maybe every week or two, but that's the kind of player, Doug Martin, that I would probably be dropping just because I don't really see much of an opportunity for him to turn it around at this point. I don't know what the deal is. Um, the skills you would think would still be there. He looked really good in his rookie year. And honestly, there were some times where he actually looked pretty good as far as like certain runs that he made last year. I mean, he had a bad year overall, including the, uh, you know, with the injury and everything. But even before that, his numbers weren't great. But like I said, there were some specific runs that I saw where he was breaking his way through lanes and really great footwork. So 
I, I hate the fact that I'm saying this, but I'm fine with cutting Doug Martin at this point. Um, I don't think that there's going to be many much of an opportunity for a situation where you look back on it and go, man, I really wish I would have kept Doug Martin because he's putting up such big numbers now or somebody starts him against you and he gets a 20-point game. I just don't think that's going to happen for you. So I don't think you're going to have much buyer's remorse or uh, seller's remorse, I should say, I guess, in this case on Doug Martin. So hopefully that answers that question for you, buddy. Third question comes from Mr. James the Gamer on YouTube, and he has a question about the quarterback position this Sunday. Does he start Tom Brady versus the Chicago Bears or Carson Palmer versus the Philadelphia Eagles? Now, both of these are great matchups, two pretty solid quarterbacks. Uh, Tom Brady, I know, is somebody that we've hated on for the most part on this podcast because he hasn't put up numbers. I mean, there's I Tom Brady is probably my favorite quarterback in the history of the league. In fact, I can't really think that there's even a competition for that. He's easily my favorite quarterback of all time. I wear a Tom Brady 12 hat sometimes in my videos, as you guys have seen. I'm a huge fan of his, but from a fantasy standpoint, he has had a very disappointing year. He was disappointing last year. The offense just isn't putting up the numbers that they normally do, but they have been doing pretty well lately. I'm going to go with Tom Brady here in an ever so slight margin. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if Carson Palmer does outscore him, but I still think that Philadelphia having an opportunity to have an extra week, they had a bye. I still think that they're going to step in with a good game plan here against the Arizona Cardinals, and that might be a little bit of a problem for Palmer because he has been prone to throwing multiple interceptions in games, and If he's doing that, that hurts his fantasy production pretty substantially. Tom Brady, on the other hand, is very, very good at not throwing interceptions. Now, I know he does from time to time, but... He is te- he tends to be more careful with the football than Carson Palmer, so I think that their upside is about the same, and the downside is a lot higher for Brady, so I don't think you have as much of a risk with him. So that's why I'm going to go with Tom Brady this week. Corbin Johnson on YouTube wants to know, who should I start, Matthew Stafford versus Atlanta or Tony Romo versus Washington? And again here, two great match- matchups, two bad defenses. I'm going to go with Tony Romo here, though, and the reason for it is that I think that Dallas's chances of putting up more points in this game are higher. I think that Washington is in turmoil right now. They don't know what to do at quarterback. Uh, their defense isn't playing well at all. And the the other thing, too, is that Matt Stafford is still likely to be without Calvin Johnson. And I know he's put up decent fantasy numbers without Johnson on the field. But the thing is, is that he has looked really, really bad in the first half of games. And it has been a big second half that saved him from putting up like, I'm not even exaggerating when I say this, like less than five points. I mean, he was on pace for less than five points, I think, at halftime last week. And he turned it around, and I know that happens from time to time, particularly with quarterbacks, but guys, it's it's a big roll of the dice right now to be playing Matt Stafford when he doesn't have his number one target on the field. It just is. And meanwhile, Tony Romo has guys like Terrence Williams stepping up, and he's got guys like Gavin Escobar who's scoring multiple touchdowns. And uh, Des Bryant, of course, is still one of the top five fantasy wide receivers in the league. And Jason Witten is still a reliable target at the tight end position. There's just so many guys in this offense, not to mention the fact that they have the best running game in the NFL right now, that just give Dallas the opportunity to put up big, big points on a week-to-week basis. Nobody questions that offense. They're one of the better offenses in the league, and they're all healthy. So I'm going to go with Tony Romo. Uh, Like I said, I don't think that Matthew Stafford is going to have a bad game here, but I think that there's just more risk, and I think Romo has the opportunity to have a big game as well. Next question comes from Ali Stair Marsden. Sorry if I pronounced that name incorrectly, but I think that's correct. And he wants to know, who should I play at running back this week? Chris Ivory versus Buffalo. Joyke Bell at Atlanta or Shane Vereen at Chicago. So Buffalo's defense has actually looked pretty good this year. Uh, I don't really think Chris Ivory is a spectacular player, so I'm going to bench him. I don't think that he's in this conversation. It comes down to Joyke Bell or Shane Vereen. Now, Shane Vereen looked great this past week. I mean, he put up big, big numbers. The question, though, is, is he going to remain that big of a part of the offense? I don't know. I really don't know. I can't tell you. And the reason reason that I can't tell you is because the Patriots don't seem to really 
give us any indication of what they're going to do on a week-to-week basis. One game, he'll have a big game. You know, week one, Shane Vereen scored a touchdown. I think he caught a few passes. He was running the ball effectively. And then weeks two through, like, five, he did nothing from a fantasy standpoint. So you look at situations like that on an offense that is consistently shown that they're not going to give the same guy carries, and it's hard to trust Shane Vereen, especially when your other option is a guy like Joyke Bell, who is normally in a two-headed backfield uh, with Reggie Bush, but now with Reggie Bush being injured, he's pretty much the lone dog back there. Yeah, of course, there might be a Theo Riddick or you know, somebody like that that gets a random carry here or there, but Joyke Bell, as long as he's healthy, is going to get the vast majority of the carries there. I still think, like I said, that Detroit's offense is good enough. Matt Stafford should be able to move the ball at least decently enough, and as long as Joyke Bell is touching the ball 10 to 15, 20 times a game, I don't see how you could possibly sit him right now for either of these other guys. Shane Vereen and Chris Ivory are going to be on your bench this week. Joyke Bell goes into your lineup at Atlanta. Hopefully that helps you out. Next question from Jacob Thomas on Twitter. And he wants to know who's the better flex, Mike Wallace or Chris Ivory? Now, again, we're talking about Chris Ivory here, but uh, this is an easy one for me. It's got to be Mike Wallace. He's scored in every game but one this year. Huge numbers, consistent numbers, which is something that we don't normally see out of Mike Wallace. But hey, when you got it, you go ahead and you take it. Mike Wallace is putting up big numbers, so I'm going to go with him. Chris Ivory, I know, ran for 100 yards this past week, but do not let that skew your opinions on this guy. He's two weeks removed for running for seven yards on eight carries. So, I mean, I don't expect that he is suddenly going to be a stud running back. Um, this just, it, it, it isn't a spectacular matchup against Buffalo. I don't hate Chris Ivory, but as long as Chris Johnson is still healthy, they're going to be splitting carries and they're going up against a decent defense. So I don't love that. I don't love the opportunity for Chris Ivory here. Now he could completely come out and have a big game and I'll look like I have egg on my face here, but I love the fact that Mike Wallace has been so consistent. They're trying to get him the ball. Ryan Tannehill looks like he's making major strides forward into being an actual NFL quarterback. So we definitely like to see that out of our fantasy players uh, when they've got a decent quarterback going forward. And that's what I think that you're going to get out of Mike Wallace. So I'm going to go with him pretty easily in this matchup. Final question comes from Jason Kirk on YouTube, and he has a flex question. He wants to know, do I start Pierre Garçon or Brandon Cooks? And I'm going to go with Pierre Garçon here. He has scored in back-to-back games, and although he's definitely taken a step back this year, I still think that he's better than an unproven guy like Brandon Cooks. Cooks hasn't scored since week one. The Saints offense right now with Jimmy Graham being hurt just doesn't look like it normally does. We're so used to them putting up 30, 40 points a game, and they just are not doing that at this point. Uh, Their running game is a little bit struggling right now with Pierre Thomas being injured, and they've had uh, Mark Ingram be injured as well. So it's been so up and down. They don't really have a whole lot of consistency right now in their offense. Brandon Cooks, like I said, he himself has been inconsistent. Um... He has had a decent few games here and there. In week one, I know he scored that touchdown, and that, of course, made him a pretty decent fantasy player. He looked like he was going to have a big year, but hasn't scored since, and that's a little bit concerning. When you've got a guy like Pierre Garçon who scored in back-to-back games and remains probably, you know, one of the more targeted players, at least, in his on his team, um, he, the only player who's really going to probably take more targets than him is potentially Deshaun Jackson, but might even not. So I'm going to go with Pierre Garçon this week, just based off of the fact that he's probably going to get targeted eight to 10, 12 times, potentially, depending on how the game plan goes. So I like the opportunity for him and I don't really see that being as consistent or as likely for Brandon cooks. So guys, I hope that answers all your questions. Again, make sure if you have any, that you tweet them at me at Clickwood TV or leave them in the comment section below. If you ask questions about this weekend's games. Unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to uh, answer them on a podcast, but what I can probably do is leave a comment on your comment if you allow it based on your settings. Make sure, guys, if you're asking a question that you have the thing turned on on your YouTube settings that people can respond to your comments because otherwise I'm not going to respond to it because it's too much of a pain in the ass for me. So anyways, guys, I hope that helps all of you guys. Good luck this weekend. Bust of the week and sleeper of the week is the final thing that I like to do each and every week here on the Fantasy Football Swagger Podcast. And what we do is talk about players who would normally be in your lineup, but I think maybe shouldn't be in your lineup. And those guys are your bust of the week. And then on the other side, your sleeper of the week is a guy who is not normally in your lineup, but I think probably should be in your lineup. So I've got one of each of those this week, guys. 
Bust of the week is going to be Deshaun Jackson at Dallas. Now, I just got done mentioning that I think Pierre Garçon is going to have a decent game this week, and I still am going to stand by that. I know that they're playing against the Cowboys, but I still think Pierre Garçon is going to get targeted enough that he's going to have a solid game. Deshaun Jackson, on the other hand, I can't believe that it's gotten to the point where I'm actually telling people not to play wide receivers against the Cowboys, but that's kind of where we are. The Cowboys have played decent on defense this year. Now, I think that's getting a little bit overhyped. I think people are acting like they're like a top five defense or something, but they've played pretty well for the most part. They're not getting just cooked like they were last year. Uh, I mean, it seemed like every single week last year, I was crying practically watching my Cowboys because they were allowing 400 yards passing and uh, multiple, multiple touchdowns every single game. But you know, now we look at it and they're playing pretty solid. So I don't really like Deshaun Jackson's opportunities here because not only is it a tough matchup for him, just given the fact that the Cowboys are playing better, but he actually has a pretty poor track record against this team. The Cowboys have only allowed Deshaun Jackson to catch six passes for 49 yards in his past two games against them. And he hasn't gone over 100 yards or scored a touchdown against Dallas since 2010. Now, I know he was a member of the Eagles in those games, but frankly, those offenses are better. We've got Colt McCoy at quarterback likely this week. So, I mean, I don't know. I don't love it. I don't love Deshaun Jackson's opportunity here. Um, I still think that he is going to be a decent player going forward, but particularly for this matchup, the Cowboys just seem to know how to defend this guy. They get right in his face, they jam him at the line, and they don't let him beat him deep. And if you do that against Deshaun Jackson, he usually doesn't have much as far as big games go. So I'm going to go ahead and bench Deshaun Jackson this week. And a guy that I would actually play above him this week, and I normally wouldn't, but this week I'm a pretty big fan of Doug Baldwin against the Carolina Panthers. Baldwin is now the wide receiver one in Seattle with Percy Harvin gone. Last week, he caught seven balls for 123 yards and a touchdown. He's been quietly Seattle's most consistent receiving option for a couple of seasons now. They've had guys like Sidney Rice. They had Percy Harvin. Um, they've had other guys who, Golden Tate is another good example. Of course, Golden Tate had a good year last year, but prior to that, he was pretty inconsistent himself. These guys are just not consistent when it comes to wide receivers, but Doug Baldwin has been pretty good. Hasn't been spectacular, but he's had those games where he's been the guy. And I think that going forward, Doug Baldwin is likely to be the wide receiver one there. And I think that he is going to put up solid numbers for the remainder of the season. But particularly this week, I like him against the Carolina Panthers defense that's allowed the fourth most fantasy points to opposing wide receivers this season. They are doing a really, really bad job in their secondary. They're finally getting exposed as being one of the least skilled secondaries in the NFL. Their pass rush is not getting to opposing quarterbacks. Russell Wilson is really, he's been very good other than the Dallas game recently. So I definitely like the opportunity here. The Panthers have also allowed double digit receptions to to uh, wide receivers in every single game this season. So that's a pretty good opportunity for Doug Baldwin. If they, if Russell Wilson completes 10 to 12 passes to opposing or to his wide receivers, I think that Doug Baldwin's likely to get six or seven of those. So that's pretty good. And then if you consider the fact that Carolina has allowed 11 touchdowns to wide receivers in their past five games alone, that spells good things for Doug Baldwin. I mean, if he's the wide receiver one and he gets six catches, it's very likely that one of them gets into the end zone. So I like the opportunity for Doug Baldwin this week. I think that he has a higher ceiling than Deshaun Jackson does this week. So hopefully that answers all of your questions, guys. I want to wish everybody good luck. That's going to do it for today's episode. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. I really hope you enjoyed it. If you did, make sure you hit that like button. And also, if you're new to the channel, be sure to press the subscribe button so that you can be updated when I put out my next episode. If you guys have any questions about your lineups, for this weekend's fantasy football games, or if you're thinking about making a trade, or if you just have any general fantasy football questions, I would be glad to answer those for you. Make sure that you leave them in the comment section below, or of course, you can tweet them to me at ClickWithTV. Thank you guys again so much for listening. Check back with us next week for a review of this weekend's games here on the Fantasy Football Swagger Podcast.